It's easier than ever to access images for our digital compositions. But whether we're artists, teachers, or students, we often find ourselves uncertain about what we're legally allowed to use and for what purposes. No one wants to get into legal trouble because they unknowingly used copyrighted words, images, or music illegally in their creative or academic work. Unfortunately, the answer to what constitutes fair legal use of online visual resources isn't always simple. But we can wade through this digital ocean of images with more confidence if we familiarize ourselves with how U.S. copyright law defines fair use, and if we pay attention to how courts have ruled in past cases involving fair use. Let's look at the fair use provision of the 1976 U.S. Copyright Act. It describes four factors that should be weighed to decide whether the use of a copyrighted work is fair, that is, if it can be used without asking for the permission of the copyright holder. First, we need to determine the purpose and character of the use. This means that it's more likely for my use of copyrighted material to be deemed fair if I don't plan to sell my final product. However, the phrase educational purposes can be misunderstood take this video. I'm creating it as a class requirement, but designing it for a broad audience of teachers and students. So what happens when I share it online? Suddenly it breaks academic boundaries because anyone anywhere can look at it. And that online blurring of the boundary makes it less certain that a court would declare my video is educational, even though I'm not selling it. It's definitely not automatically illegal for me to use copyrighted images in this video. Here's one right now but it's not guaranteed to be safe, either. Second, we need to determine the nature of the words, images, audio, or videos I'm using. For instance, am I sampling from a work of nonfiction, like a historical or theoretical account, or am I sampling from something more creative, like carefully designed professional photography or video? For instance, in this video, I should also think about where I'm getting my images from. The nature of a picture that a reporter snapped of President Obama could be described as less creative than a carefully crafted photo of a cityscape in the moonlight. Third, we need to determine how much of the original source I used in my new composition. It's more likely that something will be deemed fair use when I only take a small part of the whole, say if I only quote a few lines as opposed to half a book, or if I grab a few seconds of a movie to incorporate into my own video as opposed to a huge chunk of the original. Of course, this becomes problematic when discussing my own video that I'm making right now. Am I expected to cut down the pictures I find online? And do I need to? It's worth knowing that courts have ruled that sometimes visuals need to be reproduced in their entirety for the new composition's message to work in its intended way. This is one of many places that this legal language begins to look outdated, since it seems designed here to protect authors from having other authors reprint huge chunks of their written words without permission. Fourth, we need to decide if my new composition is going to hurt the sales of the original work. Imagine that, as a part of this video, I add a segment of myself singing along to a CD of Michael Jackson's Thriller while I'm cleaning my house, say. No one would think, man, I was about to go download that song on iTunes, but now I don't need to because I can listen to this dude sing it online for free. Sweet. So what now? Is it worth the trouble to use my fair use rights? Absolutely. Copyright law should be a balancing act between protecting the rights of creators and protecting the ability of others to use past creations as starting points for their own work. If we don't assert our right to fair use, the balance could tip dangerously toward the side of copyright owners, making it increasingly difficult for us to use the ideas of the past in our new compositions, as creative people have done for millennia. I can also protect myself by searching for media on the website of Creative Commons, a nonprofit licensing organization that helps artists and remixers legally share and find text, images, videos, and music. I'll close with some advice from a recent book chapter written by an expert in law, technical communication, and rhetoric and composition. As an exercise in fair use, I'll quote her words verbatim, but I'll pick and choose which sentences to take, pulling them out of order as I see fit. That brings up the interesting question about how plagiarism and fair use are different and similar, and if it's even plagiarism if I announce what I'm doing. First. As to individuals or organizations who insist you ask permission every time, this is simply not required under the Fair Use Doctrine. Second, if you are going to use another's copyrighted image, use as little as possible, either in size, amount, or pixels, in order to accomplish your own writerly goals, but do not be afraid to use what you need to make your point. Three, 
always work to synthesize. 4. If you are taking a position on an issue or creating a history or documentary meant to comment and criticize an issue or events, your use may be more likely to be fair, even if the copyrighted materials you remix are creative. 5. Remember the old adage, make sure what you create is your own work. This means shaping and fashioning your final piece so that you take ownership of it and make a statement different than the copyright holder. Six, there is some evidence that the tipping point in court decisions is three out of four fair use factors. Seven, don't underestimate the power of good faith. Act with kindness and respect. But unless you are a political trailblazer, you might want to heed warnings to cease and desist or risk an expensive lawsuit. Careful balancing of the costs and benefits here is important. Now go forth and boldly create new compositions. Remix, reuse, and refashion and share what you make with others.